Hello, hello. Okay, there we go. Hi, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm the assistant pastor here. I'm Aiden Handel. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. Uh, so a couple announcements before we do some greeting. Uh, we have a garden workshop this coming up Friday at 6 p.m. This is free. Um, and the point of these is just to teach us about little things about gardening so that we can be a little, um, how would you say it? self-sustaining in a way where you can grow your own crops and all these things and so um, everyone is welcome to that and that is at 6 p.m. here at the church on Friday we also have worship night on the last Thursday of the month at 6 p.m. and so come to that it's a great time to just come together as a family in the middle of the week and just worship the Lord and the last thing is movie night April 19th um, this is going to be for families and for everyone who likes movies. We're going to be watching a, a classic. We're going to be watching Narnia. And so uh, at, at this movie night, we're going to have popcorn. We're going to have candy. We're going to have uh, drinks of some kind, probably. <laughs> um, and so please come. Come enjoy. Uh, summer's coming up. And so we're just trying to create more opportunities so families can come out and people who just have nothing else to do and just want to enjoy a movie and so come join us and, and be a family with us and, and come to that movie night so now at this time it's time to greet and like where my wife is from i want you to say how you doing right
You 
Hello? Hello? Wow, that's loud. Um, hello, my name's Joe. Um, if I've never met you before, um, I'm not a pastor. They just let me grab the mic from time to time and sit up here and babble a little bit. So um, I wanted to share a story with you this morning. Um, but by the way, first things first, how many of you are enjoying the weather? Um, we do, so I've got a small landscaping company in Billings here, and so in the wintertime, we do snow removal, and my son called me up yesterday, and he's like, Dad, Dad, are you guys going out? And I, I told him, nope, we've officially declared winter's over, so I don't know, we'll see how that works, I guess, for now. Um, anyway, um, me and my wife, um, last month, um, celebrated sort of an epic moment in our marriage, and that is... We've been married now for 17 years. So, um, woo! Um, anyway, if, if y'all have are in a marriage or if you've been in e even like a really, really close friendship, um, you know with, with that, um, number one, it takes a lot of work. Um, I, as I reflect back, like on the 17 years I've been married, man, my wife and I, we've gone through some stuff. Um, you know, we've raised three kids. Or correction, two kids. We've got one left. We've got a 16-year-old at home. Thank you, Jesus. We're almost there. Um, but I mean, so we've 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 celebrated or experienced rather, um, yeah, a lot of stress. So with that, I mean, loss, conflict, um, financial hardship. Um, I've struggled. Uh, there were seasons in our marriage where I've struggled with drugs and alcohol. Um, so there's addiction. And, and I've heard it said, like, to make a marriage work, it takes 50-50, right? And uh, for our marriage, I mean, there's been nothing that could be further from the truth. Um, there were times, like dark, dark times, right? Like, where I, I had nothing. And I would say my wife certainly carried us through those, those seasons of time. Um, maybe I had 10, maybe 20% to give. And my wife, and I, and I would hope if you asked my wife, she would say, yeah, there were times where I, ha I had nothing. I wasn't, I wasn't there. And, and Joe carried us through those, those seasons of time. Um, what I love about God, on, on, on the flip side of that, is God says um, in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And one of the things I think about is, and sorry for the, the morbid illustration, this is what I think of. When I think about God in that verse, um, we've all seen like a heart monitor, right? And when somebody goes to pass, there's sort of like this flat line and it's straight, it, it's moving forward, um, unwavering, unfaltering. And that's, that's God to me. That's what that verse means to me. And then there's this roller coaster, which is me, of emotions uh, going up and down. And when I choose to seek God, um, when I'm in fellowship w with the Lord, you know, I get to experience that in those crosswaves, and I, I'm, I'm sort of experiencing perfect fellowship with God, steadfast. And that's what that verse sort of means to me. So I just wanted to share that with you um, this morning. So thank you all for listening, and um, let, let's say a quick prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you for um, your steadfastness, so that I, for one, just like long for your presence, your love, that peace. Um, and I just pray for anyone here this morning, God, that, that maybe they're just not feeling you, Lord. We are, we're just so desperate for, for you. And I pray, God, that you would just wrap them up in your arms, that they would experience your presence, your peace, that you would, you would whisper in their ear, God, that you are very much present and you haven't grown tired. You're not weary. Um, you haven't given up. And uh, Lord, also though, that we, we know we have our part to do in that and that we would be a people that, that seek you. Um, and even when we don't feel it, even when we're not feeling it, Lord, that, that we would just have a hunger, a thirst for your word and, and to do what you want us to do and, and walk with you in obedience. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sit if you'd like, uh, stand if you'd like. Let's worship our Messiah. My Jesus, my 
Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, Tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Oh, shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power.
Awesome worship. Can we give a clap offering? So, this week has certainly been a week. <laughs> Anyone else? It's been a week. Anyone? And um, so, this week I was cleaning my car and I was going under my mat, and for some reason, Mind you, I drink nothing that's in glass. There's a piece of glass that was broken under my mat, and I completely cut my finger open. Um, my poor dad's driveway looks like a, a deer was gutted there. Um, <laughs> then I'm cleaning the dishes, and I'm Hispanic, and so we do it by hand. And the dishwasher is more for storage, right? And so uh, when I forget that, that the dishwasher is a dishwasher, I try to do it myself. Well. I'm using the sponge, and I'm doing the blade towards myself, oh. cut myself again, started bleeding again. <laughs> then, this morning, out of all other times, right, out of all other times, somehow, some way, the refrigerator was left open overnight. All my food went bad, and I have no food to go home to after I, w I preach, and that's, that's my, my sanctuary is my food when I get home after I preach, you know. And so I wake up, all the food is bad, and it has just been a week. Now, I'm not telling you this for any sort of pity or anything like that. I'm telling you this because I'm human as well, and I understand. Sometimes you have these moments where your flesh wants to get mad, your flesh wants to get bitter, your flesh wants to do all kinds of things. And so right before I came to preach, this, the refriger refrigerator thing happened this morning. I could have got really mad at myself, right? And I did for a moment. But I had to say, Lord filled my fridge one time. He's going to do it again. Some way, somehow, my, there's going to be food on the table by the time um, I get home. And sometimes we have to realize that the Lord is always on our side. So let me pray over our weeks because maybe you had a week like this where you're just all over the place in your mind. Maybe family members are sick. Maybe finances aren't doing well. Whatever it might be, let's pray over that. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we have miracles all around us that are constant because of you, Lord. You bless us in the little things from our children to our food to a shelter, Lord, from another day of life, Lord. We pray, Lord, for our stresses. We pray for the things of the week that we carry on our shoulders, Lord. We give it to you, Father, because you're the one that could carry a limitless amount of weight. We thank you, Lord, that you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing the, the series that we've been in, the God Strategy. Last week we were in... Um, the God strategy again, but it was more based on the Easter message. But well, we're going to go back into Romans once again. And if you're saying, Pastor, I am tired of this, I say, congregation, too bad. <laughs> um, and so last week, Pastor Jared delivered an Easter message and gave us this perfect lineup 
for the winning team in our life. And this winning team that he explained was Jesus. Through a strong and impactful message, he concluded with the last section of Romans 8, a chapter of Romans that has been pivotal and important in my walk and calling with Jesus. The basis of this chapter of Romans is that we are more than conquerors through the love of Jesus, that nothing, absolutely nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. As we come to a conclusion to this first section of Romans from 1 to 8, Paul convinced us about man's need and God's plan in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now in Romans 9, what we will go through today through chapter 11 in the next couple of weeks, Paul deals with the problem, problem associated with the condition of Israel. What does it mean that Israel has missed its Messiah? What does this say about God? What does this say about Israel? What does this say about our present position with God? If you think that um, Israel and Christianity are somehow separate, we're a lot more like brothers and sisters, right? We have been joined in into the family, into the promises of the Jewish people through Jesus. And I'll explain that more as we go through the message. The purpose of today is to show you the God strategy of using an account of Israel's mistakes in order to show the character of God and how th and through it how we are given the opportunity to become part of the family of God through adoption. And so we're going to go right into the scriptures that okay. Yes, yes, good. Romans 9 1 through 5. I speak the, the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I would wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. And so what we see here is a change in tone from Paul. In Romans 8, Paul is, is going off. He's saying the, the love of Jesus is so amazing. And he, he leaves us at this, at this hill point where we feel victorious in the Lord, where we're like, yes, we're on the Lord's side. And then we start in Romans 8, and, and Paul kind of changes the tone to a little, a little more depressing. He says, I'm in anguish. I'm in sorrow. The question to ask here is not does Paul have emotional problems, but what is the source of his sorrow and anguish? And the source of his sorrow of anguish is his own people. Why? Because his own people, the Jewish people, had everything they could possibly ask for in God. But they acted as though they had nothing in God. And many times we do the same exact thing. Insight number one is this. When we fail to see what we have in God... We want the things that are not of God. And so when we don't see the millions and millions of blessing that the Lord gives us, it's easy to be jealous. It's easy to be envious and to want something else, to want something that fills our, our flesh. I remember at some point while I was in college for pastoring, I was a commuter from an hour away of my college. Sorry. <coughs> Sometimes when you give too passionate, your, your throat gets dry. <laughs> and so um, I was in San Bernardino in California, and my school was in Costa Mesa, which was by the beach, which is by um, Santa Barbara, Santa Monica, the ones you see in the movies, those kind of beaches. And so I was an hour away from these, um, from my college, and I remember that my circumstances weren't looking very well. I didn't have 
much friends because I was a commuter, and so I didn't have time to hang around and, and go to the events. I remember waking up at 3.30 in the morning to skip the traffic that LA brought. I would get to school at 5 a.m., I would sleep in my car to 8, and then I would go to class. That was my week. And I remember countless times where I slept in my car because I, I had saved money on gas because I was a college student. And I remember my back hurting. I had my little, um, what's that called, that bag of like bathroom stuff. And I would go into the bathroom. I would wash my face, put deodorant, and go to class. And I remember many times I wanted to give up on college, on going to become a pastor, right? Now, let me remind you, I'm not saying that you have to go to college in order to be something. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that you don't have to go to college to be a pastor. There's plenty out there. But, but, what if I were to give up and I were to drop out of college? It's not that I'm disobeying myself and my own values. I'm disobeying my father and what he's called me to do. Because from where I came from, my parents didn't have a lot of money. It was a miracle that I was able to go to this college. Not only that, I had my girlfriend at the time, Savannah, my wife now, who had college, college meals. And so you, you swipe a card and it, it takes off a meal. And so she would swipe for me, so I had food. Not only that, I had this little Honda Fit. Anyone know what a Honda Fit is? It is like a little pill bottle. Like it is tiny, right? With a big, ginormous window. And that's all I had. But I remember that I could get from San Bernardino to my college on $30 of gas. Now that's a blessing right there, right? And so when I look at the circumstances, I want to give up on what the, what the Lord wants for me. When I look at what the Lord has given me, it gives me the option to not give up. You see, the Lord provided everything to me. And why I tell you this is because like me, many times we look at our circumstances and it's easy to miss what we have in God. And it's not always easy to remember the affinity of blessings we have from God, just like the Jewish people were forgetting what God had given to them. And that's where Paul's anguish was from, because his own people, the Jewish people, couldn't see it. They couldn't see the blessings that they were a part of. They were able to be in the presence of God, who, who would want that? Everyone. Everyone should want that. And they had it, and they missed it. In Romans 9, 6 through 12, it says this, It is not as though God's word has failed. For not all who have descended from Israel are Israel. Nor, because they are his descendants, are they Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children will, were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Paul thinks of someone looking at Israel and saying, God's word didn't come through for them. He didn't fulfill his promise for them because they missed their Messiah and now they seemed cursed. How do I know? And you have to imagine, Paul is imagining the opposing, the opposing team. And he's, saying, he, he's thinking, how do I know that he will come through for me? Doesn't that sound a lot like us today? 
we look at other people and we see their house or they, we see their marriage or whatever and we, we ask, Lord, I see that you came through for them. Good for them. But will he come through for me? Will you come through for me, Lord? I know that this land can seem a, a little confusing when it says it is not as though God's word has failed for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. And then later on it says for not all, I repeated myself, but it's okay. What Paul recognizes here is the inclusion of the Gentiles, which would be us and to the promise and family of God. We are not descendants of Israel. None of us, I think, are Jewish, but because we dedicate our life to Jesus, we're part of the Jewish promise. Amen. Because we dedicate our life to Jesus, his teaching and his values, we become part of the promise. Everyone tracking with me? Does that make sense? In simple terms, we may not be Jewish, but because we have been adopted into the family of God by Jesus, we have inherited the promises made to the Jewish people by God. My brother Nalu, my spiritual brother Nalu isn't here today, but he usually sits in the back over there, and he's from Hawaii. And we're not related by blood or anything like that. He is full blood Hawaiian, and I am Mexican and Middle Eastern. And so you have to imagine for Easter last week, right? Um, I'm Mexican and Middle Eastern. My wife is Mexican and Puerto Rican. We are Latino and Latina. Yeah. And so when we had Easter dinner, we had something called panir, which is a Puerto Rican dish, which is like pulled pork. Delicious. Uh, maybe someday Savannah will make a, a ginormous one for all the church. Just kidding. Um, she's like, <laughs> uh, we also had arroz con gandules. Hard word to say, arroz con gandules, right? And all that is is rice with uh, pigeon peas, right? Pigeon peas. And I remember in the background, we, we always have to have Mexican music playing in the background. So there's Spanish music playing in the background. Now, let me remind you again. Nalu is not a lick of Hispanic in him. But because we have adopted him into our family, I'd say Nalu has become Hispanic without being Hispanic. Now, let me, now let me show you why I'm saying this. Maybe it's going to click here. In the same way, you have become part of the family of Israel without being Jewish. And at the table, your adopted father, Jesus, through his blood, his sacrifice on the cross has placed a feast before you. A feast of blessing. A feast of identity and value. And don't even get me started on the feast of love he has on the table for you too. And guess what? In the background, Jesus is playing a tune of how we have victory from sin. This is the family we are now adopted into. This is the family we are now adopted to. This is now what is at our table. This is now what is our value. This is now what is our identity. And so insight number two is this. We have been welcomed into the family of Israel through our adoption by Jesus through his blood. In verse 11 and 12 it states, Yet before the twins were born talking about Jacob and Esau, or had, any, or had done anything good or bad in order that God's promise and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. What Paul is trying to clarify here is by bringing up the story of Jacob and Esau from Genesis 25. It says, It was not by works, Instead, the reason for choosing Jacob was found in him who calls. So what is trying to get across here? And this is insight number three. What Paul is trying to get across here is your ability 
to become part of the family of God is not by your works. It is by answering the call of Jesus for your adoption appointment. It is not by works. You can't do anything, anything to deserve the adoption God has placed for you. But you sure can answer the call and show up to the adoption appointment. In Romans 9, 14 through 16, it says this, What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens who he wants to harden. Aye, right? Paul is trying to answer a really hard question here. And the question is, is God unfair in how he dispenses mercy? And Paul says, absolutely not. And then Paul, knowing his readers, goes to the next question that he believes is going to be asked. And is this, well, then why does it seem the Lord shows mercy to some and no mercy to others? And Paul gives us this definition of mercy. The definition of mercy is to give, is to give a chance with no obligation of giving the chance. Does that make sense? It cannot be called mercy if you have an obligation to show mercy. The same thing goes for salvation. God doesn't owe us salvation. Then he's free to give it to all, to some, or to none. It's the Lord's choice, so it's mercy. If it weren't the Lord's choice of showing mercy, then it would become an obligation. Remember, let, let us not forget, we are all sinners deserving of death. So the salvation that is offered to all of us is truly undeserved mercy from the Lord. And if I, if I lost you there, it's, it's, it's an ebb and flow. It's kind of hard to track with. But the point is this. If God had an obligation to show you love, it wouldn't be truly love. If God had an obligation to give you salvation, then it truly wouldn't be salvation. If God had an obligation to show you mercy, then it wouldn't be truly mercy. In Romans nine seventeen through 18, and I know we're going through a lot of scripture, but this is the Bible, so there's a lot of scripture. It says this, For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he has mercy, and he hardens who he wants to harden. You might be saying to yourself, Whoa, 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 Pastor. It sounds a lot like predestination and not a whole lot of free will. Like you have your own choice. The answer that Paul gives us is that God's rejection of Pharaoh was really just a, an extension of Pharaoh's own choices. The question that you have to ask yourself in understanding this is womb reject, who rejected womb first? The scripture says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart to resist the Lord's message but that statement comes after the sixth plague. Can I be honest here? It may seem a little confusing, right? But I want you to think, we, me, me and Savannah were talking about this yesterday. And um, my, my brother has had a 
ebb and flow with Jesus. He's been with Jesus, not with Jesus. He's been all over the place with Jesus. And he's made some bad choices. I've made bad choices too. And my brother has too. Now, now my brother made, he made bad choices on his own accord. He chose to choose those bad choices. And now my brother has, is finally coming back to the Lord. And this is what you have to see is the Lord can, tr- can, can take those bad choices, right, because he chose to do them, and he could turn it around for his glory, right? Now, we want to say, oh, we're praying for them. Some are saved. Some are destined to, to be unsaved. No, that's not true. Our choices are our own choices. And when we finally, call, when we finally answer the call for our adoption appointment, God could finally take those bad choices and say, all right, let's turn it around, and let's turn it around to show me glory. That's good news, isn't it? That when we make bad choices, when we lived a life that was not fully in accordance to Jesus, when we finally get on track, he could turn it around for his good. It doesn't matter about your good. And matter about his good. Let's not get it wrong. It's about his good. Our life is to show glory to the king. And so let me be honest here. For my, myself as a preacher, and I'm going to be very vulnerable with you today, is a lot of times I want to know who in this room is saved and unsaved. Why? Because in my head, if I only knew who was unsaved and saved, then I, know, I would know if my message is doing something. You see, this mindset makes, it puts myself in some dangerous waters. Why? Because in reality, I have nothing to do with salvation. I cannot determine who is saved and unsaved. And if that was on me, I have to be honest, and I've said this in Bible study before, the weight of the responsibility of knowing who is saved and unsaved and determining who is saved and unsaved would crush me as a leader. I would no longer be able to do the work of being a preacher if I was so determined on knowing who is saved and unsaved. And so let me tell you this here. I am more worried about you answering the call of adoption than you making the choice of saying, I'm fully following Jesus as a preacher. Why? Because if I can lead you there, then it's going to be your own choice and not a choice based on me. A choice that's not based on my character and my passion. I know I could be pretty convincing. I'm just kidding, right? I don't want you to do anything based off of me. So if me as a preacher can lead you to saying yes to Jesus on your own terms, that will do more than if you follow Jesus because of who I am. And it's awesome that this this, this responsibility that I feel sometimes of wanting to know who is saved and unsaved, it's awesome that the Lord takes that responsibility and that heaviness off my shoulders. Why? I have to be on, I'm a very eternal, per, internal person. I'm a, I'm a thought person. And so if I'm constantly thinking, I cannot, I cannot do this well. My responsibility as a preacher is to present you the opportunity of salvation, but it is, the God, but it is God's authority to dispense it, to see your heart, and to know that you're living a life out of your salvation. I am the one who tells you you have an adoption appointment into the family of God. But it is you who has to show up to the adoption appointment to be adopted. You get the difference. I, if I had the choice, I would adopt all of you into the family of God. But it is not my choice. It is the Lord's choice. 
Romans 9, 30 through 33, it says this, What then shall we say that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were for works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. And as it is written, it says, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Paul comes to his conclusion and answers the question, well, why then did Israel reject him? Why did they reject the Messiah? Why did they reject Jesus? Paul gives his answer in verse 31. Israel rejected the Messiah because they would not humble themselves before the gospel. Verse 32, 32 well, why is that? Why is that? Because they did not pursue the Lord by faith, but by works. Paul's answer was not that Israel rejected Jesus because God predestined them to do that. He says that no, Israel rejected the gospel because they chose to not humble themselves before God and accept salvation that was through grace by faith. And so they have no one to blame but themselves. Salvation is something that God owes to none of us but offers to all of us. We all have an adoption appointment, but you need to be humble enough to put aside your ego, to put aside your thoughts, and to put aside your life, and to show up and to be adopted by God fully. And what does it mean to be fully adopted by God? It means that you no longer act like you're part of your earthly family and so can I be honest with you church is that okay as I was practicing this message it affected me almost almost to tears yesterday at night and I had my little coffee and all those things and you might be asking yourself pastor well how would this apply to you you're already saved you've already been adopted right but that's not that's not the point I remember countless times in my life where I had felt as though I was adopted by the Lord, but acted as though I was not adopted by the Lord. As I fell into temptation, as I fell into my thoughts of anxiety and fear, as I hated my self-image, countless times as I fell, I felt that I was unworthy of the family name that came with Jesus. I believe that many of us have felt the same way, unworthy to become part of the family, to say, yeah, I'm, I'm with God. He is my father. Can I tell you something, though? Again, can I tell you something awesome? I have a spiritual brother who was abandoned and struggled with lust, and he's free and married now with a baby on the way. I have another spiritual brother who was molested, basically raped, and struggled with lust. He's married with a little boy now. I have a spiritual sister who struggled with severe anxiety to the point that she would faint and completely blank out. She's free and is a missionary across the world now. I have another spiritual brother who was an addict to meth who lost so many members of his family that I remember meeting him and he was, he was putting a, a mask on because of the sorrow that he felt. Now he's free, married, and has been clean for a couple years now. Sorry. <laughs> now what, what do they all have in common? What do they have in, all in common? They all come from broken and unperfect families. Just like we all do. None of your families are perfect. Not one. Not even my family. And we're all pastors. Not one. 
But what we have to realize this is what they all have in common is they did not let their blood family define their place in the family of God. You get what I'm saying here? So if you come from a family of addicts and you say yes to Jesus, you are no longer a part of a family of addicts. You come from a family that is bitter and angry at everything. When you say yes to Jesus, you are no longer a part of a family that is of anger and bitterness. And the list goes on and on. And for example, maybe your family is, is riddled with suicide. When you follow Jesus, you are no longer part of that family of suicide. How are you no longer part of the earthly family? How, or maybe how can you become not part of your earthly family? Because your blood no longer defines the family you are part of. The blood that defines the, the, the family that you're a part of is the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone. It's time for you Christians, right? Maybe you're listening to this and you're like, okay, pastor, I get it. This message is for new believers. It's for people struggling with their faith or wanting to follow Jesus. But as I said to you, Many of us have felt we have been adopted but have not acted like we're adopted. Maybe you, you're, you've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years. You can still act like you have not been adopted into the family of God. So it's time for you Christians who have followed Jesus for many years to act like you've been adopted. And for you who don't follow Jesus yet, it's time to show up to your adoption appointment. Jesus is waiting to adopt you into the family of God. And in the family of God, your earthly values are no longer your earthly values. Your mindsets are no longer your mindsets. Your heart is no longer your heart. Why? Because now it's all aligned to the king. You are under a new father. You are under a new family. So you are under a new title. And that is daughter and son of the living God. The God strategy of Romans 9 is to use the account of Israel's mistake in history to point to the character of God. He is in control. He is all powerful. And in the end, it is not our business to try to figure out God. Because the weight would crush us. Our business is to know the God that is in business. The one who gives us the opportunity to become part of the family of God through adoption. When we get into these mindsets of, I need to know why the universe is still expanding. I need to know if there's aliens somewhere else and they've seen Jesus. I mean, people get all kinds of crazy thoughts. And when that becomes the focus... When that becomes the focus, we, we lose attention on the God who is in business, who is doing something now here on earth. We must be aware, church, that our failures can blind us from adoption, that we have an opportunity to become part of Israel's promise and through Jesus without being Israel by blood, and that there's an adoption appointment into the family of God with your name on it. Your personal name on it. But you have to be humble enough to show up and to accept it. You have to be humble enough to show up and accept it. And so that means with all your flaws, with all the sin you got going on in your life, right? I don't know if you know about the adoption process, but many times people get overlooked because of their, who, where their family came from. If they were from a family of addicts, well, I don't know if I want to introduce them to my family, right? Or, oh, they have anger problems. Well, I don't know if I want uh, a kid that's angry. You see, when you get adopted into the family of God, Jesus overlooks that and says, I just want you to be part of my family. I don't care about your mistakes. 
I don't care about your flaws. I don't care if you were an addict. I don't care if you struggled with bitterness. Right now, I want you to be part of my family. And that no longer defines you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, that you offer us an adoption with you, Lord. You have adoption appointment with all our names on it, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you are so loving, that you're so merciful, that you are so powerful, Lord. So if there's anyone in this room today that wants to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior for themselves, as their own choice, if you would look up to me and look, make eye contact with me, I see you, I see you, I see you. Lord, we pray for all these brothers and sisters who are deciding to follow you. We pray, Lord, that they walk the walk with you, that they become part of the family of God, no longer defined by their mistakes, no longer defined by their earthly family, no longer defined by all the things of their past but they would be welcomed in and there would be a grand celebration with you, Lord. Father, again, that you are ready to adopt us into the family. We thank you for this out throughout this week, throughout this year, and for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So, have a great Sunday, the Sunday. I love all of you. Now go and act like you've been adopted. Go wash some dishes in the dishwasher. Don't make a mistake like me. And have a good, good Sunday. Love you all.